So good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out to an evening of poetry at Adrian's Memorial Library. I'm Deborah Schoen, and I'm a librarian here, a programming librarian, and I actually um, book people to uh, do programs and performances here. So um, Honorable Torrance, R. Harvey Sr., and his twin brother, Torino, he's right here in the audience, um, <laughs> Torino Harvey were seen daily on a very famous dance show in the late 80s and 90s called Club MTV with downtown Julie Brown, if, if any of you remember that. Um, TNT twins from Club MTV were a part of the New York City hip hop dance scene for many years. Honorable Torrance R. Harvey is also the current mayor of the city of Newburgh. Uh, he has a BA degree in acting from Morehouse College. He also has a Master's of Science degree in Education and History from Mount St. Mary College. Honorable Torrance R. Harvey Sr. has also studied in an acting conserv conservatory master degree program at the Theater School of DePaul University. He has been a member of the Screen Actors Guild since 1992. And he is also a history teacher in the P-TECH program at Newburgh Free Academy. His tenure as a history teacher has been for the past 22 years and counting. Uh, Torrance and his wife, Tina, of 21 years, share three children, a daughter-in-law, and a new granddaughter, Nina Renee. So congratulations to you. So if everybody helps me, give him a nice warm Poughkeepsie welcome. Thank you, thank you. Let's get Deborah and the Adrian's Memorial Library a hand. I'd be remiss not to uh, say that this is where I learned how to read. I learned how to read at Morris Elementary School uh, off of Mansion Street. And, uh, and then my mom would bring my brothers and sisters and I, uh, all eight of us, <laughs> here to the Adrian's Memorial Library. So this is a nostalgic moment for me um, to be here. Um, my wife just walked in, Tina Harvey, the first lady of the city of Newburgh. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> my nephew, Radasha Wilsey Anthony, Maritza Velasco and her daughter, Zyla, and my twin brother is here as well. So I'd like to acknowledge them. So run. Run like your life depends on it. Run like no other has ever run like you before or done it like you've done it. So chase your dreams, for they are your dreams to dream. Paint your picture and picture your success on blank canvases that you believe and your imagination can see. Paint your pictures and run to those pictures like eternity. Run like your eternity is tied to your destiny and what you see and believe for you to see. Run, just run. <laughs> My culture stems from the beginning of time in human history. So we pour libation in the Atlantic and praise God for the birth and fossil resurrection of Lucy. The oldest human fossils known to Odovai Gorge, Mother Africa, Shout out to archaeological digs of Mary and Louis B. Leakey and the significant sounds of natural resources being extracted from that land for consumption and obstructless capitalists worldwide and to all we send thee. And finally, my culture stems from a bloody untold human history that too captures the hidden colors of forever. Colors of colorful rainbows as 13 moons divide themselves in cycles of 23. Holy Father, Holy Grail, we sing praises for the Holy Trinity. Study up, black boys, and learn the journey of human history of Ghana, Songhai, and kingdoms of Mali. Wrap this knowledge around your consciousness and dig the dark skin that you're in. How we count our days and time shall confine or define or possibly even hide the mind from greatness. It's time to watch our sun rise and shine. Our culture stems from the beginning of time. Yeah. When I face those indigo blue skies or look toward that light, my shining star, she's so dainty. 
providing a reflection of who we really are. We are effervescent beings, simply being shining stars, transparent, elusive, complex, running through the universe like humanistic race cars. Zoom, zoom, our music is pervasive. Boom, boom, our music is pervasive. Our music is our alchemy. So use your elements to create and go gold. Our music speaks volumes. It speaks volumes to many humanistic race cars near and far. So speak. So speak, I say, speak. If I find a spot where truth lies, I would whisper those memories of my children's future so that I might live a brighter now. Now is the essence of my domain, which contains all that was and will be. So who will be singing your next song and tell the correct human history? My music speaks volumes. It speaks to those indigo blues stolen from Haiti, like coffee beans and coca. She's so dainty. That's my shining star. She's so dainty thus far. Indigo. <laughs> Yo soy un hombre solamente. Negro y fuerte. No necesita las drogas. No necesito las crímenes. Pero escúcheme, por favor. Yo soy un hombre solamente. Negro y fuerte. La gente en esta ciudad, en la ciudad de Newburgh, es más importante than el dinero en la ciudad. Escúcheme, porque yo soy un hombre solamente. Negro y fuerte. Gracias. <laughs> little Spanish poem I wrote. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as uh, was mentioned earlier, I've, I've read, the first poem I read was Run, and uh, that's actually the last poem that's written in the book America, America that I completed and got published a year ago. It was actually in uh, around July of 2021. So during the COVID shutdown, I wrote a lot of this work, and the last poem in this book is entitled Run, and I actually did a, a, a video. Um, it's about a 40-second to 50-second video. Just inspirational, run, run like your life depends on it. You know, chase your dreams, for they are your dreams to dream. Paint your picture, picture your success on blank canvases, right? So. So that, that's what that was, just to, to tell people, you know, you gotta, in life, you got to run after these dreams. You got to chase them. You got to, you know, go after whatever your imagination is telling you and your spirit. Because I tell my students at Newburgh Free Academy, um, which September will be my 24th uh, school year. <laughs> uh, we're getting close to that 30-year mark. Um, but um, I tell them, I said, you know, these are your dreams to dream and chase them. You know, you have to run after them. Like your life depends on it, you know. If you find your passion in life, you'll find your purpose. And that's what I've done. I've, I found my passion in the arts, the performing arts, theater, television, film, and even poetry, you know, being able to um, memorize monologues and Shakespearean monologues and check off and things like that, you know. And I found it so challenging. I was telling my wife before we left the house um, at 5 o'clock, and we got, just got here at 7. Um, <clears throat> I was telling my wife that, um, you know, it was very difficult for me to memorize my own poetry for performance as opposed to Shakespeare's poems or, you know, uh, the, the, you know the writings of Chekhov or, you know, James Baldwin or others, you know, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks's works or what have you. Uh, which they all were inspirational to me. It, you know, for when you write your own stuff, it's kind of weird to turn it around and be able to memorize that work. Um, but they do mean it's important to do that. The work means a lot. Um, so, um, Yah Sankofa was the first book of poems that I, I wrote and published. And this is a collection of works that go all the way back to the time I met my wife at my freshman year in college <laughs> at Mount St. Mary College. Uh, before Torino and I uh, end up transferring to Morehouse College. Um, so Ya Sankofa, Sankofa coming from the, the, the Twa language of West Africa, um, from the Ashanti tribe. Um, and uh, Sankofa means to look back, you know. And if you look at the symbol of the bird, Sankofa, you know, the bird is looking back, but the, the feet of the birds are still moving forward. 
So as a history teacher, I love and appreciate um, being able to look back at the relics of history, knowing and understanding and being able to contextualize whatever's happening now into what has happened in the past because I always tell students that history is the passport to our future. So Yasen Kofa is a, is a testament to my ancestral roots. Uh, if you look on the, on the cover of the, of the book, uh, there's an African, uh, the African continent, and there's a woman in the African continent in the silhouette of the continent because we say that Africa is the motherland. And the reason why we say that is because of the birth of humanity uh, and on the continent, which connects us all. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, so that was Yasin Kofa. And then America, America uh, was written uh, during the shutdown, during the 2020 COVID shutdown and got published last year. Um, and it speaks to the uh, social justice movement and the social justice movement that's currently happening. Um, and uh, I'm trying to pick up the line here. Um, yes, yeah, the, the current social justice movement in America uh, from the African American lens, the work center around the cultural awareness and cultural responsibilities that we all have as avenues to create positive change in America and around the world. So when we look at race, class, ethnicity, race, um, and our sociological or socioeconomic circumstances, it's important to have these conversations and these dialogues, even when we disagree, because there's a way to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, we can have our differences, you know, I mean, look, just think about how polarized we are as a nation right now. Republicans and Democrats and whites and blacks and Latinos and Asian Americans, et cetera, et cetera. We are a nation of immigrants. Como se dice lo en español? Somos una nación de los inmigrantes en los Estados Unidos. You know, mi esposa es puertorriqueña. My wife is Puerto Rican, so, uh, you know, I, I speak Spanish because not, I studied it for many years, and then she and I, we continuously work on the, on the language. Porque mucho gente en los Estados Unidos hablan español también. Uh, there's a lot of Hispanics and Spanish-speaking people in America and, and in toda la mundo, in, total, in the world as well. So uh, I think it's important, again, when, when we look at the social justice movement currently happening, whether it was the, the death of George Floyd or um, Philanthro Castile, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, and, you know, um, I'm just trying to think, of Trayvon Martin and so on and so forth, it's just a, a, a testament of how and why America, America needs to wake up and we need to embrace our cultural differences and our racial differences and celebrate them. That's the point, right? Multiculturalism should permeate not only school curriculum, but libraries like the one we're in here where I learn how to read, um, but they should, multiculturalism should permeate uh, our all day-to-day all -day lives and, and our walk in life, on our jobs, in our social circles, at our restaurants, you know, uh, we have a rich, rich history and a rich culture with a diverse uh, tapestry, right? We have a very beautifully diverse tapestry. And that's what this book is about, celebrating multiculturalism and not being afraid to have these tough conversations about race, class, and ethnicity. <clears throat> so I say that leading into the, the as they would say on, a, on, a, on an album, you know, here's the title song to the record. <laughs> the title poem, uh, America, America, and here it is. Uh, and it was inspired by James Baldwin, written October 31st, 2020, which is during the uh, global shutdown, uh, the pandemic. America, America, land of the free, home of the brave, land of our forefathers from which you never saved on the forefront of American prosperity when America never wanted me and my ancestors to truly be free. Because my ancestors were enslaved, not even for how he or she behaved, for that U.S. Constitution was said to be made us as three-fifths of a human to count your population count for that bicameral legislature the Congress had to be made. Oh, America, America, land of the free, home of the brave, the non-free black man was skilled yet killed, and the dry bones still remain in his tragic grave. Medgar, Martin, and Malcolm, tragically torn from society, but more importantly torn from their own beloved families. 
Their daughters of the night still weep at night as their torn souls still sleep and their mama still wept themselves to sleep many nights. No matter what I do, I'm still crazy over you, America. But there are things we all still dread. You don't even seem to care about the children of the famous fathers who are now still dead. North, south, east, and west, if you are a black man or a colored immigrant, you are a second-class citizen reduced to nothing again and again. America, America, tell Mr. Charlie to leave me alone. Your ideology of purity rejects but still needs to reflect a back to the ancient dry bones. Check your blood blueprint. Check your polypeptide strands. We are all made from the same human. Then observe and trace the lifelines in the palms of your hands. Some of you are part Negro too. The story of the Negro is the story of America, for which you already scientifically knew. The evolution of man has its spiritual rituals and entanglements with miscegenation in a bloody human nation chilled with the human cold sensation marked with our nation's national anthem. So shall we stand to sing the songs of truth for our ancestors for generations to come, my man? <clears throat> Denmark Vesey, Sir John of Truth, Ida B. Wells, John Brown, and Nat Turner too were all brave Americans who stood for liberation. So we pour libation to remember their names. America, America. Land of the free, home of the brave. Never turn your back on our people, the descendants of former slaves, so its sins can finally be washed away for this great nation to be saved. For I am not the son of Shaklak Clack. I am from before that. I am from before before. America, America, America. Thank you. So I don't know how we're doing on time. I do have a couple more if you all want to hear. Yeah, we have like three or four more hours. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. <We're>, okay. <clears throat> so during the um, <clears throat> 2020 um, shutdown, <clears throat> babe, can I get a little bit of a sip of your drink? Thank you. She's got some something liquid there. Um, <clears throat> during the shutdown, <clears throat> thank you very much. So during the shutdown, we had um, a series of things um, happening in the city of Newburgh. And um, one of the things that I always said was the nucleus of the challenges. I don't like to say uh, problem, right? The nucleus of the challenges in the city of Newburgh, like in a lot of urban cities, um, has been the increase of gun violence. You know, um, I think it's a national uh, issue or matter <clears throat> happening um, throughout the United States of America. And gun violence, you know, um, had been sort of uh, synonymous with the, city, the name of the city of Newburgh, right? So one of the poems that I wrote um, during the shutdown, um, it was like the, early in the, in the quarantine. Um, we shut down, and I want to say March, the second week of March, 2020, and uh, that same weekend, 55 gunshots made the city blocks hot wow. in the city of Newburgh. And uh, that inspired this piece here. 55 gunshots made the city blocks hot. Why shoot your shot during Corona? The invisible virus. Ain't people dying proof for you? Grandma and grandpa and uncles are afraid. No need to see those 55 gunshots ablaze. Why make the city blocks hot during again the worst healthcare crisis of age? Influenza, like didn't you think somebody could get hurt? Couldn't you see another way to win? The coronavirus, it's a global pandemic. Yeah, the block's been hot while our black and brown been slinging them amethyst rocks. It's a way out of poverty. Like, give me a fix of that purple rain that drives brains insane in the membrane. 55 gunshots made the city blocks hot. But let's represent peace. And why not? Um, let me see.
see if there's something in Yasin and Kofa. Uh, so I'm going to go back to Yasin and Kofa. So that was America, America. But in Yasin and Kofa, I wrote a poem uh, dedicated to the great late uh, Maya Angelou. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maya Angelou, like I said uh, earlier, uh, she she was one of my, my favorites. Obviously, Gwendolyn Brooks, James Baldwin, Langston Hughes. I mean, the list goes on and on to... Um, to the writers and the poets that um, even the recent uh, more more contemporary poet Saul Williams Saul Stacy Williams definitely one of my inspirations he's he's known for slam poetry he's born and raised in the city of Newburgh NFA graduate <clears throat> class of uh, 1990 so he he and I are contemporaries um, but yeah Maya Maya uh, passed away I believe it was June 2014. Um, and uh, so this is a dedication to the late great Maya Angelou and uh, it says um, she spoke to me in my sleep telling me to go ahead and take a leap of faith to achieve my dreams that seemed to escape me in my awakened state she spoke to me in my sleep as I ran through the fields of Mississippi with the yellow daffodils that seem endlessly filled with my thrills of a joyful occasion. It was still early in the morning because I could feel the heat from the early morning sunrise and its misty deep dew deep within the grassy roots brushing against my work boots, bumblebees and pretty b- bright butterflies that too enjoyed that beautiful sunrise. When she spoke to me in my sleep, I could hear the deep, rich texture of her voice asking me, who are we to block the human creativity with which to witness and inspire others? Who are we to turn down God's vessel to speak to someone else's despair? Who are we to ignore that special calling? Who are we to silence the message that will set someone else completely free? She spoke to me in my sleep, and her voice came as a quick spiritual surprise. But just like life, I rise. I rise, I rise, I rise. Even with those twisted lies, yet still I rise. Thank you, Mother Maya. Should we do like a little Q&A? Is that that something? Sure. Yeah. yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's. I'll, I'll. We'll take some questions from the audience, and then uh, you know, kind of let this thing organically evolve. Uh, thank you all for coming. Yes, ma'am. Olinda Martinez from Newark as well. Oh. Um, Miss Martinez. Why poetry? Why not short story? Why not another medium? Why poetry? Because <laughs> that's an excellent question. Um, Poetry because, you know, when my twin brother and I were young, you know, I always tell people we were born in the 70s, made in the 80s. So <laughs> poetry and, and rap, you know, like if I say, uh, they, 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 there's a cor- correlation, right? When you talk about I- iambic pentameter, you talk about, you know, the uh, literary devices in poetry, whether it's uh, anamonopias you know, similes, uh, metaphors, uh, personifications. Those things um, spoke to me because, like I said, we were born in the 70s, made in the 80s. So if I say, um, if you're shooting for the moon, you must go higher. Life's a gamble filled with desires. So follow through with what you do and your dreams, boys and girls, will still come true. Because if you believe in what you try, then your dreams, yo, they'll never die. So take a stand. Come up with a plan. But don't come across as the average man. You got to show technique to the highest people and be unique. Seven days a week. Peace. Right? So that, those are some of the rhymes that we wrote when we were younger. In high school, just like I remember in high school, um, so we, we went to K through 11 Poughkeepsie High School, I mean Poughkeepsie schools, um, and then junior year, we started dancing on Club MTV with downtown Julie Brown. Now, this is before the internet. This is before, you know, social media, right? We, America watched the same shows for the most part. You know, we watched the Dukes of Hazzards. We watched Alice. We watched... 
uh, I don't know, uh, the Cosbys. We watched A, a Different World, you know, uh, The Jeffersons, uh, The Good Times. And, you know, so we all watched, if not the same programs, uh, very similar programs day to day. And we didn't have the Internet. And so I remember, um, a, we, well, once we got on, on uh, MTV, it was six days a week. There were 30-minute shows, Monday through Friday, and Saturdays you had back-to-back shows. So it was an hour long, but they were 30-minute shows. So when we got on television and start touring around the world with MTV, we were famous, you know. We weren't rich and famous. We were just famous. <laughs> we, we started doing off-Broadway plays, TV commercials. We got our agent. We had a management, um, Shirley Grant management out of Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, she discovered the Jonas Brothers. She was also Keisha Knight Pulliam from the Cosby's manager and, and a, a long list of um, actors, child actors. So we, we were doing all that kind of stuff. And then we moved to Hopewell Junction our junior year. And we were all upset because we were like, we want to graduate from Poughkeepsie High School, <laughs> you know. Uh, but my parents, you know, were like, well, you guys are doing real big, big television and film work. So they moved us out to uh, Hopewell Junction, and we finished high school at John Jay Senior High School. And I remember Torino and I were asked to do a a rap commercial for um, Mothers Against Drinking and Driving. Mm -hmm. And so we had to write a rap, and we said, if you drink and drive, you lose your strides. Your dreams are shattered, and your brain cells die. Friends who tell you that drinking's cool don't pass the word because you're not the fool. So here we are to celebrate. Uh, drinking and driving, you'll meet the death date. So never drink before you cruise because if you drink and drive, you lose. Besides, we got other things to do. I'm feeling all right. I'm out of sight. I got the girlies to the left and the fellas to the right. You drink, mix and mingle with a little art. Guess what? We celebrate smart. And that was the drink and drive commercial we did locally. Thank you. We did locally for, um, I get my wife hurt. Her coffee back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, like, we were doing rap, rhyme, <clears throat> writing rhymes, and we're talking late 80s. So, this is like 88, 89, 1990. Uh, we finished high school. Um, but to, not to interject, but mm -hmm. to kind of answer your question, too, you know, um, a lot of his poetry is more performing arts. So, right. like, when I hear him do the poem, Run, or when I hear him do the poem, America, America, um, I can see that he wants to physicalize right. his poetry. <laughs> so, like, it's amazing because when we did um, an example, we did uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a play written by uh, William Shakespeare, and we played one character, um, uh, Puck. Rob Goodman. Mm -hmm. right. So we did the entire monologue, um, which was poetic, um, but in a physical, in, in a very physical way. Right. <clears throat> so um, we even did um, Poseidon, where we uh, the Trojan the Trojan women or the Trojan War. Yeah. Was it the Trojan War? Based Trojan. on the Trojan War. Yeah. Yes, women of the Trojan War. We did yeah. a play where we played Poseidon. Also, we played one character, which was a poem. Um, that was written at the time. So, I, yeah. it's so it's interesting because when I listen or I read his poems, I can also see the physicalization of what he's trying right. to get across. So when, one of the reasons why I'm here today is to uh, give him that other side and say, okay, you know, I'm thinking to myself, why is he standing behind that podium <clears throat> as opposed to doing a choreographed physical... Uh, and it's right, and and great point because the only because I know I'm, I'm being framed right here, <laughs> and this is being recorded. Or and but so. yeah, Torino's right. You know, we 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 come from the um, the golden era of hip hop in the seventy late seventies, early eighties. Um, so poetry, rap is poetry, right? And so and then. We studied a lot of, we studied in the theater, we're trained in the theater, like you said, with the Shakespearean um, play that we did, um, Midsummer Night, we played Robin Goodfellow, who was the puck, and we said, thou speakers are right. I am the merrier wonder of the night. I just so run and make him smile when I have fat and bean fed horse begot. Nay, and like us of a Philly floor. Sometimes lurk I in a gospel's boat. Still got the, 
Still got it yeah. there, you know. <laughs> you know it's just, and very like it's a roasted crab and went against her lips, I bob. And on the withered do that pour the ale, the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale. And sometimes for a three foot stool mistaketh me. Then slip from her bums down, tuffle she. And tailors holds her lips and cough. And the whole choir holds her lips and laugh. And married and waxes and knees and swear. A merrier hour was never wasted there. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. So, like, so, you know, if you listen to Shakespeare, you hear the rhyme schemes and you hear the um, the traditional poetic um, right. timbre and texture. But I can so also was, see him physically doing the right, movement right. of, you know, sit, mistaking me for a three foot stool. But sometimes, right, right. you know, he, so there's a whole physical aspect right. that I think with his poetry that we're going to do in terms of film. Right. You know, we're going to have the poems, but also the physicalizations. Right. That go along with it. And if you go right. to your site, mm -hmm. I think one there's of There's two videos. There's, there's two uh, videos My Culture that. and then Run. Yes. Right. So and you'll see some of that, phys the, the poetry physicalized. But right. t to the point of short stories, novels, and mm -hmm. things like that, I'm, I'm still evolving as a writer. Um, I, I just wrote, uh, I want to say, four or five children's books. Um, one is... One of the manuscripts is with the publisher now, and I'm a little upset. They're like, oh, we're not going to release this until April of 2023. I'm like, no, let's get this out now. Like, so, you know, you, the process is, a, it's a process, right? And things yeah, take yeah. time. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so children's books are next. Um, as an elected official I, uh, in, this, in civic engagement, they're in the theme of civic engagement exposing um, the role of a ceremonial mayor as opposed to a strong mayoral system like you have in New York City and some of the realities that I've uh, and some of the interactions I've had with kids going to schools speaking with kids and you know I did uh, I did a speech uh, it was a my brother's keeper program for the New Windsor Elementary School recently just before school closed um, <clears throat> and um, they were all waiting outside in the parking lot <laughs> when I got to the school and they were like, oh, is that the mayor? Where's his limo? You know, and they were like, where's his police detail? You know, it was like, they thought that I, like like Eric Adams in New York City, you know, he has he has limos or trucks, you know, these SUVs with dark tent windows, and they roll up, you know, and then he has like a full police detail. And so they were expecting that for the city of Newburgh's mayor. And I was like, oh, man. I can educate them with these children's books and let them know the difference between a ceremonial mayor and a strong mayoral system in a large city. 30,000 people in the city of Newburgh versus 10 or, 10 or 12. What's that? I don't even know the difference. Yeah, there's a difference. See, there's that civil. We don't even know the difference. Well, the difference is, yeah, when you're in a small city uh, like Newburgh and other small municipalities, a uh, ceremonial mayor is... Uh, sometimes on the chairperson of the council. So it's like being the chairman of the board. So I'm actually a part of the legislative process in the city of Newburgh. Whereas in a larger city like the city of New York or Chicago or Detroit, they have a, the mayoral system is a strong mayoral system and the mayor is over all the different departments. So Poughkeepsie was for, forever a ceremonial mayoral, mayoral system like Newburgh was, uh, Rob Rollison, who's a good friend of mine, Mayor Rob Rollison, shout out to Mayor Rob Rollison of Poughkeepsie. He's my buddy. Um, he was able to get the city council to uh, go through a charter review and, and, and the public hearings and all that process to turn the city of Poughkeepsie's mayoral system from a ceremonial mayor system to a strong mayor system. Right. Uh, so he was very his his position was very much like mine when he got elected. But uh, I want to say two years ago, maybe it was just before COVID, um, they switched it to a strong mayoral system like they have in New York City. But typically in the small cities that, you know, how many, how many uh, people in the city? Uh, Poughkeepsie is very similar to Newburgh, uh, about 30,000, roughly. I, I don't know the exact number, but in the New city, York city is how many? You're talking 10 to 12 million, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So the city of Newburgh's city budget is 70 million if you include the enterprise funds, which the enterprise funds are independent funds like water, sewage, and sanitation. 
we have about a seventy million dollar budget. New York City's budget is ninety billion dollars. Wow. The state of New York's entire budget for the whole state is a hundred and ninety billion dollars. Wow. So New York City, the five boroughs, they have about half of what the state budget is. Now that's substantial. Ninety billion, seventy million, a hundred and ninety billion for the entire state. And yeah, yeah so let's say um, yeah, I mean, their sanitation department alone is probably, uh, their budget is probably $100 million. So, and, and, and so, Mayor Adams, I'm sorry, since we're getting on there. Civic, civic, civic and get, uh, yeah, government. So, Mayor Adams is the mayor of all five boroughs. He is, and he's in a strong mayoral system, which means that he is in charge of all the departments and their leadership. So it's the police department, the fire department, um, the educational department, which we call the DOE, Department of Education. Uh, New York City's DOE, Department of Education, is so um, large and so um, substantial that they do, you know, obviously coordinate efforts with New York State um, Board of Regents like we do in the city of Newburgh and Poughkeepsie, but they have their own commissioner of education, you know, um, I think it's the gentleman from the Eagle Academy. I can't remember his name off the top. He's the commissioner of education. Whereas our commissioner of education is in Albany, <laughs> you know? So yeah, so New York City, like Chicago, on your larger cities like Los Angeles, they their mayoral system is a strong mayoral system and the mayor, uh, and like Atlanta, they are in charge of all the department heads Whereas in a, in a ceremonial mayor system, uh, I'm on the city council and I have a vote. Okay. What, what about the presidents of the boroughs? Like, yeah, so you have so that's what it is. You have this this multi layer system. Okay. So you got borough presidents. Right. They answer to the mayor. Oh, okay. Right, and so they're elected as well. Yeah. It's almost like in the city of Newburgh, you can equate it to our ward system, like in the city of Poughkeepsie. Oh. So in Newburgh, we have four wards, and we have a ward council member, you know, uh, Giselle Martinez in World, uh, Ward 1, uh, Ramona Monteverdi in Ward 2, uh, Bob Sklars is a councilman for Ward 3, and Patty Sophocles is the council member for Ward 4. So you got four wards in the city of Newburgh, and then you have two council members at large, Councilman Grice and Omari Shakur, they're at large, and then I'm the, the uh, well, there's four, there's six, and then I'm the seventh member on the council, but I'm the chairman of the council. So I chair the meetings, I'm the chairman of the board, and what's cool about that is I get to introduce legislation and vote on it as well, and so I'm in the legislative side, but I'm also part of the executive um, branch as the mayor and the executive team. Yep. Oh, one and then two. Um, yes. I I was wondering, how could you guys never put out an album? You guys are good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we had some demos. That's we had some great. demos. You know, the message yeah. is really good. And Thank you. And another question is, well, I don't want to get two questions. Yeah. You wish you had a strong mayor uh, position as opposed, as opposed to the ceremonial in Newburgh? Yes and no. So it did at times, right? So, yeah. what, um, and if and that, the, my answer fluctuates because because I'm not in a strong mayoral system in the city of Newburgh, I still get to teach. So my full-time teaching job, yeah. I still do that. And as soon as I leave the high school teaching my global history and geography, my American history and government classes, I go to city hall right after. The city manager is there full-time uh, in, in a system that, like I said, uh, a ceremonial mayor, mayoral system. So he and I, our offices are right across from each other. Um, like I said, I get a, a, an opportunity to legislate. If you're in a strong mayoral system, you don't legislate. You don't create laws. <clears throat> and those legislations are very important to me. That's why I got into local politics after teaching you know, civics and government for so many years. I said, oh, man, I got to get involved. You know, I can't just teach the talk. I got to walk the talk and teach the talk. Mm -hmm. And so now, so, so I like have this third eye for government. So I can see things that... It's almost like looking at a psychedelic picture, and if you look at that picture long enough, things start moving. <laughs> you start seeing things other people can't see. So it's like having a third eye. And so I, like for instance, um, good cause eviction. 
you know, me and, and, and my colleagues were able to get that moving. Uh, even though it's being challenged in Albany, we did that. Now we're looking at Airbnbs and, and um, how how do we regulate Airbnbs with, with uh, these are um, short term investors, rental investors, and how do we regulate that so that uh, the housing stock isn't you know, um, taken up and there's no availability. And if there is housing in, in our city, because we're in a crisis, we're below that 5% threshold of available housing for people in the city of Newburgh, like probably Poughkeepsie and other, Dutchess and Orange County and Ulster County. And, and when that happens, whether it's a, an apartment, the prices are astronomically high, $1,700 a month wow. or $2,000 a month for a one bedroom yeah. or for a studio. And, or if you're trying to buy a home, you know, what typically would have been a $200,000, you know, one family home is now 450000 So when we look at the things that we're doing legislatively, I like being in that because that's how you really make a difference in your local community. Um, moving on legislation, uh, appropriating funds, voting on the city manager's uh, um, annual budget or proposed budget. So that's always fun. If I if I were you know the mayor, I would I wouldn't be able to vote on that. You know, so so there are pluses and minuses. I like the, and then the other thing is here's the history lesson, and I, I and I apologize in advance if I if I go on and on about it, but because the history lessons in the in the early 20th century, early 1900s, they created a ceremonial mayor and a city manager system because of the. Um, because of nepotism and uh, local uh, corruption, right? So Mayor Adams, when he got elected in New York City, he gets to appoint people that helped him get elected, right? And that might work for a large city like New York City, right? But in a small city, oh, that's bad. So if I get elected mayor, which I have two times already, right? I had a special election and then my full term election after Mayor Judy Kennedy passed away and I was appointed. Um, now it's like all the people on my campaign, now I'm gonna find them jobs. And that is really sticky icky when you get to a local municipality where there's 28 to 30,000 people. It's different from a, a city where you got 10 million versus 30,000. Yeah, just like uh, Spring Valley, yeah. They're more. They're not a um, ceremonial. I think the village of Spring Valley is. They may have a town supervisor because no, no, no. Oh, they, they have, have a mayor. mayor. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but the mayor there, I think. You're right. I met the has, mayor um, of Spring Valley. You know, different, I guess, responsibilities, and they right. have not to, you know, but they, they've yeah. had some really serious things happen there, where a lot of it falls on the lap of the mayor. Yeah. You know, and the town clerk right. has a lot of power. I want to get to the AKA system. <laughs> Naisha Gibbs, Naisha Gibbs. 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 by way yes. of Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn. I've got the office already incorporated. Yes. My question is, how did you go from the arts to history, civic government, and now you're back full circle in the arts? Wow, that's an excellent question. Um, so Shakespeare said all the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players, and every man and woman in their day plays many parts. We have our exits and our entrances, right? So this is a stage when I'm in front of a class. This makes me feel like I'm in front of a, a, a class, right? Or a college, a university, right? This podium here. Um, as my twin brother was saying, a lot of times I move this out the way so I can physicalize, but I know I'm being framed. There's the film, right? So, so I'm being framed, so I wanna stay in this frame for the, for the, for the uh, integrity of what they're doing here at the library for this video. Um, but the point is, um, so yeah, so, we were working on film uh, and on off-Broadway plays in New York City when I got out of Morehouse College. Morehouse! Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, I'm a part of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Well, one night! Oh, six! Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so I uh, belong to the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and Morehouse graduate. And, uh, and so when we graduated from Morehouse College in 1997, I went Spike. I I met Spike Lee. Um, you know, I worked for the president at the time um, of Morehouse College, Dr. Walter Eugene Massey, one of the top three physicists in, in the world, right? And a lot of celebrities would come through his office. I was a work study student uh, in uh, the president's office at Morehouse, 
And so I met Spike. Spike invited me to 40 Acres in a Mule on the Cab Avenue in, uh, I guess, the Fort Greene area of Brooklyn. You know Brooklyn. And so uh, I met Jason Lampkins and Michael Pinkney. We call him Boogie. And his whole 40 Acres, uh, their whole crew. The film we worked on that summer was called He's Got Game with Denzel Washington, Hill Harper, uh, and Ray Allen. And uh, what's the famous football player, um, the running back? From um, Jim Brown, Jim Brown had a cameo. He had a pre. He was yeah. He was in the film as well. So anyway, so Spike said, "All right, you're going to be a photo double and stand in for Hill Harper." And uh, Ray Allen had just got drafted, in, in June of 1997 to the Milwaukee Bucks. And you know, Ray Allen became one of the greatest three point shooters aside from Reggie Miller, Michael. I mean, um, Larry Bird, Larry Bird. Uh, uh, Reggie Miller, Ray Allen, and now Steph Curry are the great three-point shooters. So anyway, so Ray Allen hadn't even played ball in the league yet. He had just got drafted that summer and worked on Spike Lee's movie, He's Got Game. He played Jesus Shuttleworth, I think it was, right? And so I was Hill Harper's photo double and stand-in. And then when Ray Allen's standing, because Ray Allen's about 6'2", 6'3". Hill Harper's about 5'9". Five, 5'. Five. So I was Hill Harper's stand-in and photo double. And uh, Ray Allen, uh, when his guy didn't show, I stood in and was photo double for both. So I worked on that film the entire summer. Uh, then we went. I went from that to Belly. It was Nas' stand-in for the entire film of Belly, which is a hip-hop classic. Then I went from that to um, working with John Singleton on Shaft. <clears throat> Shaft with um, Sam Jackson. Uh, I was Ruben Santiago Hudson's photo double and stand-in for the entire film, right? And uh, Lynn, Lynn Thickpen, God rest her soul, I, rest, I worked with her on an after-school special. But anyway, after we did Shaft, and that was around 1998, there was a major commercial strike in, in, the, uh, in New York City for the union. And then that commercial strike trickled down to films. And, and so unless you were Will Smith or Denzel Washington, the auditions and... The, you know, the, the opportunities just dried up. So I started substituting at the Newburgh and Large City School District, the elementary school, the junior high school, because we had junior highs at that time in 98, and, uh, and then um, to Newburgh Free Academy, right? So I, the first person I substituted for, I'll never forget it, it was at Heritage Junior High School, which used to be known as Epiphany, uh, and that was uh, for Gary Van Voorst. In fact, he was calling me when I was on my way here. Gary Van Voorst taught an eighth grade American history class at Heritage Junior High School. And uh, when I walked in the class, because Gary didn't leave any lesson plans for me. <laughs> He's my buddy. He's retired now, so I can say this, right? So he didn't leave any, any sub plans for me. And I go into the room, and there's like 30 junior high school uh, students. And, and then this aide walked in, and this aide walked in, and she sat in the class the whole day. And I was like, is she supposed to do that? Like, <laughs> so I was very popular. I was probably in my late 20s, you know, and, and the, the little girls was like, oh, my God, is that our substitute, you know? And so uh, I said to the kids, I go, what are, you, what, are you, you know, what are you guys learning? And then the airplane, paper plane went across the room, and they were like, yo, I'm out, bro. It's a substitute. I'm like, uh, have a seat took control of the room. Shakespeare said all the world's a stage. And the kids said that they were, they were learning about the reconstruction period in American history. And here's where the aha moment happened. So I just start writing on the board, 13th Amendment, the abolition of slavery, 1865, reconstruction amendment, 14th Amendment, uh, equal rights and protection under the law, gave uh, former slaves uh, citizenship and equal rights and protection under the law, and it prohibits uh, discrimination in housing and employment. 15th Amendment gave African-American men the right to vote. Women doesn't get the right to vote till the 19th Amendment in 1920. So I was going on like that and writing on the board. And the kids were like, mister, are you a substitute or are you a real teacher? Because I was giving them notes. Yeah. And, um, and then we were talking about the Reconstruction era Rutherford B. Hayes pulling the troops out of the South. But can, I, can, Jim Crow, can I interject et and say, you know, one of the things about college education, and especially Morehouse College, is it's a liberal education, right? 
liberal meaning all inclusive. So we learned in what we consider um, uh, cross disciplines. Right. Mm -hmm. So while we were at Morehouse, <clears throat> we always held 22 credits, double major with a minor. So we were doing the plays, you know, um, after classes, right. singing in the glee club, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. after classes, but all the long, we were doing the math, the business math, doing the the English, the history, history classes, classes, the world history, the American, yeah, and had these list type grades. So I think the interdiscipline, um, and it's so funny because even with you um, doing the the political stuff and being the head of the council and stuff like that, remember you and Carl Robertson were on what was that? The RLC council. The RLC Resident council. Living council. So even in college, being on the RLC Council is the exact same blueprint for the city government of right. Newburgh. So right, but, but to the young lady's point, doing film, television, and theater in New York City and things slowed up for the union members, I started substituting. And then I was like a fish, like Torino was saying, I was a fish in water because when you go to a historically black college or university, you're going to get more, I mean, you're going to get a lot of stuff. And, and, you know, when you're talking about social movements and you're talking about um, the social justice movement, that's like the hallmark of a lot of HBCU curricula, right? And so when I went and talked about the reconstruction, it was like, it was, it was like, yeah. And then I also was good at history because I was able to look up to the left and see numbers or whatever. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a visual learner. Have, I think I have a photographic memory, so if I see something in writing enough times flash in front of me, I can close my, my eye and see it in my mind's eye. So I was good at history classes like that. I could, oh, 1492, Columbus. Oh, 1906, the P Pure Drug and Food Act. Oh, okay. You know, and I could do that, so whenever I had to take those upper-level math classes, pre-calculus and business calculus and stuff like that, like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you know, I would if I didn't if I got less than a, a B, I would take an extra history class too, mm -hmm. to to balance out that GPA. Mm -hmm. So I get an A in the history, world history, or special topics history class, and then I'd have a C, let's say, in a, in a pre calculus trigonometry class, and that could balance me out to a three O. So you know whatever, right? So yeah, so when so I had all that. So I go into this classroom. I'm like a fish in water. Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. I start teaching these kids, and they're like, mister, you're, you're like a real teacher. You're not a substitute. And then, you know, um, after a while, it started getting around in the district, you know. And here's the other point. There's a shortage of African-American teachers, professional educators in the classroom, number one. And then number two, African-American men in the classroom and that's why I've stayed with it because data and statistics, national data will prove from the Department of Education that when you have an African American male in front of the classroom, there's something magical that happens with the kids and it's not just the black kids or, or the black and the Hispanic or the Asian American, with all the kids, even including the white kids something happens in it and i was reading some data on that and that the their graduation rates and things like that astronomically increase because you don't see a lot of african-american men in the classroom we see them you know mostly as security guards custodial workers you know you might see some uh, at the administrative principal level administrative ranks but you don't see a lot of african and so uh, one of our morehouse friends um he has a campaign, and it's um, it's entitled "Real Men Teach." Right, so if you Google "Real Men Teach," his stuff will pop up. And he's a Morehouse graduate. I can't last name is Valentine. Um, can't remember Curtis. Curtis Valentine. And so he found out that I was not only the mayor, but uh, a long-standing educator for twenty. Well, it'll be twenty-four years in September. Um, and he's, he, I, I bought the sweaters and the t-shirts and we took pictures and he, you know, we did this online uh, campaign to support his movement because it's real men teach and the, you don't see a lot of male educators to begin with and then especially African-American or Hispanic males 
in the classroom, you know. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, that's how I transitioned, substituting. I love it. Yes. Um, could you tell us what your website is? Yes, absolutely. So if you go to my website, it's www.torrenceharvey.com. TorrenceHarvey.com uh, is T-O-R-R-A-N-C-E-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. And if you go TorrenceHarvey.com backslash books, you'll see the books. Uh, if you go TorrenceHarvey.com backslash work, W-O-R-K, you'll see a lot of the film footage that I referred to, um, the MTV footage, um, stuff with De Niro. We were, I worked on Righteous Kill. I worked on a uh, lot, of, lot of films, a lot of big films. We Own the Night with Joaquin Phoenix and uh, who was the young lady? Um, uh, I think it was uh, Menendez, Eva Mendez. Yeah, Eva Mendez, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. A lot of lot of film work, um, and I love I love film. You know, my my when I got into teaching too, I said summers teachers don't teach in the summer, <laughs> typically. <laughs> um, and uh, I said, oh man, I can get into film, I can get into the film and theater stuff in the summertime. But what it is is that all the films that are shot in June and July, they're already casting that stuff in like mm -hmm. April May. So the timing is off. <laughs> so I was like, and then, you know, uh, a lot of teachers struggle in the month of August financially because they get their big check at the end of June. And then they go on vacation and they spend all their money with their families, their wives and children. And then in the month of June, they're cashing in coins. So a lot of teachers teach summer school. And I've taught out of 24 years, I, I, I teach summer school. Am <laughs> right, Ritz? <laughs> August is a rough month for teachers. So... Hudson Valley is becoming yeah. a big film uh, yes. mecca. Yes. Are you are you participating in any of that? Um, yes, but more on the government side. So uh, Sunny and uh, her husband. I always I always forget her husband. But anyway, uh, Umbro Studios, Choice Films. Uh, Umbro Studios is in the city of Newburgh, and there's been such a demand for um, film in the Hudson Valley that. Uh, Summer and, and her husband, they, they've expanded Choice Films and Umbro Studios. They teamed up with a guy named Ted Doring, uh, and they bought Anthony's Pier 9. So there's no more Anthony's Pier 9 in Newburgh, or well, New Windsor, technically. And uh, I was told by friends that worked with Spike Lee, who called me, and uh, my man Boogie, he goes, Harvey, yo, twin. Do you know the city of Newburgh has the largest green screen in, in America? And I was like, oh, really? So then I called Summer and I was like, and, and sure enough, um, you know, we have the largest uh, green screen. I don't know if it's located at the Anthony's Pier 9 or if it's located on our Broadway because uh, Choice Films and Umbro Studios has a satellite uh, location on Broadway, the city of Newburgh. And I don't know if the green screen is on Broadway or if it's in Anthony's Pier 9, but they have, uh, according to my friends in 40 Acres and a Mule, the largest green screen uh, in the United States, wow. if not the world. And that's, that's how much film is being brought to the Hudson Valley. So I've gotten involved with, um, and I told Summer, I told Summer and her husband, uh, Tony. I told Tony and Summer, I go, listen, I got my SAG card. <laughs> I keep it up. <laughs> I was like, I, I've been a SAG member since 1992. So, um, you know, if you need me, I'll let your boy, you know, if you need me to, you know, say, I'll just need one line. I just need a day player rate. And that's it. You know, so they, they said, Harvey, we're going we're gonna to find something for you. You're, you're the mayor. We're going to, but uh, yeah, so, but I've been totally supportive. They have a, um, a boot camp called Below the Line Boot Camp. And a lot of our kids, and this was like a dream come true to me, a lot of our kids, young people, and even adults, take the boot camp program. Um, I think it might be a four to six week program where they learn the behind the scenes things in, in uh, film, film productions. And we, they've had at least four, if not five, graduations already. Mm -hmm. And some of our young people are working. Matter of fact, this weekend, they're going to be filming on Broadway in a lower corridor of our city, Broadway, uh, Liberty Street, Broadway, and Ann Street, um, which is, uh, you know, 
the lower corridor of the downtown area of Newburgh. And a lot of our kids and young people, and even adults, are like production assistants and they're, you know, working those films uh, and that's and they're earning money. They're working and making money. And uh, some of them have even gone on to New York City where the big films are. Um, and uh, they, they've got, uh, obtained the skills through this below the line boot camp. So I know uh, our community development block grant funds have been you know, approved and given to this uh, Choice Films to get our inner city kids involved so that they learn and earn and learn at the same time. Um, shout out to Tree, uh, was it Tree Arrington? Tree Arrington was <clears throat> a good friend of mine from Poughkeepsie and uh, he had an a organization called Real Skills. So I always say our young people need to learn real skills to pay the bills, right? And um, we're doing that through the film program there. Yeah, so it's, it's good. Right. Any other questions? I think some other people wanted to read some of their oh, poetry. Oh, do we have other poets? What's the boot camp called? Or oh, Below the Line Boot Camp? Cool. Yeah, it's uh, at um, Choice Films and, and Umbrella Studios. Any other poets? Any other? Anybody want to share any of their poetry this evening? No? Everyone's good? Yeah. All right, so if you want to finish us up with a couple of poems or sure. there, that would be great. I'll, uh, Can I ask you if you're hooking up with me? Because your eyes light up when you talk about film. I right. just want to let you know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if they light up when you talk to politics, but it definitely light up when you go talk about film. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's very clear to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you hooking up also with the Latino film festivals in New York and the, and the um, Black African film series and you know I haven't thus far but we need to um, mm -hmm. I, I know um, Mr. Fontaine uh, Tina you know remember his first name uh, Mr. Fontaine um, did a film festival before. he's a Latino uh, young man gentleman I can't remember his first name but anyway Mr. Fontaine uh, is Cuban American right and he, he and his wife live in the city of Newburgh. They bought uh, a building, redone, they redid the entire building, uh, even the carriage house. They restored the historic carriage house, and they bought a couple other buildings in the area where they live off of uh, Lander and Chamber Street. Anyway, um, he did a, a film festival, a huge film festival, uh, and um, the theme was... Um, green going green and 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 uh doing film productions that were ecologically friendly to the environment and stuff and before covid I, he did a huge film festival that lasted i think at least a week and a half and uh, a series of films and latino and african-american filmmakers were involved and that was uh 2019 and he and i are talking now to do another one because that one was so successful before covid uh, so, but that's something that uh, Ellen Philo, she's the pers our go-to person in the planning department for film, uh, and then um, she, so she and I are having those conversations where we can bring more film festivals to the city of Newburgh, and or um, travel to the city and see you know if we can network with some of the folks that are doing that uh, at a large on a large scale in the city. Well, we attended uh, uh, Lincoln Center. Yeah. For the New York Film Festival yeah. uh, with Saul Williams. Saul Williams, yeah. He's a Newburgh uh, native. He's one of our native sons. Uh, he did, uh, what was the name of the film? Uh, Neptune? Yes. Something Neptune. I uh, can't remember. Anyway, he did. He was entered into the New York yes. Film Festival. And last summer this time, we went down to Lincoln Center and saw his film. He and his wife wrote, directed, and um produced and uh, it was it was really good um, so yeah so we would love to engage that uh, uh, more because yeah I, I love film that you know uh, when I when I retire hopefully I'll have some some scripts I also have a friend uh, she and her husband are very much in the uh, entertainment business her name is uh, Michelle um, she goes by Michelle Valentine but Michelle Vega uh, Latina she she's one of the lead singers for the cover girls back in the 80s um, and Michelle and I talk from time to time because she works for Viacom which 
used to own MTV, uh, and now Viacom, from what I understand, merged with Paramount. Paramount, mm -hmm. uh, um, and so she and I are talking. She's been sharing some information with me on on script writing and how to get into that. And um, so, uh, and her husband is in the entertainment business. I think he manages several rap artists like Busta Rhymes and Rod Digger and. Uh, so she and her husband are very much so. I, you know, they're good friends of mine, and they don't live far from here. Actually, they uh, uh, live in the East Fishkill area. But um, so yeah, I, I love film, uh, and and hope to continue to engage it and and reengage it on a full time basis at some point. So, so I have a poem entitled "Evicted," evicted. I'm sorry, evicted. I cut through grass and blaze new paths for others to follow. I stand tall on the shoulders of ancestors that came before us, whose spirits follow us as I stand firm on hollow grounds and platforms unfound. Do you hear the sounds of achievement echoing through the trees as the wind blows spirits whisper the truth? The next generational success is in the hands of our youth. Don't shoot the children, I shout. Don't shoot the children. For they are already infected by time, infected with complex time and shine and how to shine and when to shine. And it's my time to shine in their mindsets. Let's reset their mindsets for the future. Microphone check, microphone checker, riggedy bow. So what's going to happen now? Our water's contaminated. There's a recall on Walmart's fruit and lead paint on radiators that are poisonous too. Don't shoot, don't shoot the children, I shout. Stealing their minds and our minds was the greatest thing they thought they did. Fortunately, I mastered the matrix as a kid. So I clearly can see what they did. Therefore, I cut through grass and blaze new paths for others to follow. It's the Department of Defense. Evicted. Mm -hmm. probably have one more <laughs> I don't want to play myself <laughs> um, um, I'm trying to see if there's a uh, uh, something real good for you guys um, oh this one was um, who shall stand and it was a poem uh, dedicated to my father um, and I read this poem at his funeral in July, on July 14th of 2020. So my father was a Korean War veteran, and um, my wife and I took him in uh, to our home uh, two years before he passed away. Uh, he was legally blind, he had tetanitis, so he had 40% hearing in one ear and no hearing in the other ear. Uh, and he, he lived until he was 88 years old. And, um, you know, at the funeral, um, I read this poem, and, and, uh, and that was 2020, you know. Um, so this is dedicated to the man uh, known as Wula. We call him Wula. Who shall stand for this man? Who shall stand for this man like he stood for you before you knew you? Who shall stand, I say, today, tomorrow, yesterday? Who shall stand for this man? His time has expired. So who did he inspire? Who shall stand for this man, I say, as we stand to represent a man of noble deeds? His transition to the other side has been seen as very, very weary and weak. 88 in the age and date to this date. Who's paid the great dues for his inspiration? Only if you knew his human history filled with actions that solidify his legacy, embedded within me and your legacy. His mom and father may have dealt with his birth as a tragedy. Who shall stand? Who shall stand for this man? I shall stand for that man all the days of my life. Ashe. Ashe. Thank you.
thank you guys for <laughs> I got a little emotional with that one. Thank you for sharing uh, this moment uh, and this time here with me and the Adrian's Memorial Library. This library means the world to me. Again, um, it's nostalgic for me to come back home to the city of Poughkeepsie, New York, um, because again, this is where I learned how to read. This is where I learned the importance of literacy uh, and education. Um, you know, and um, you know, <laughs> I knew I was coming, obviously. And um, a week ago, I drove through the city of Poughkeepsie, and I literally drove to Morse Elementary School and took pictures because that's where I went from K to three. And I went to, which is on Mansion Street, and then I went to um, <coughs> Columbus Elementary School because at one point, uh, Morris Elementary School was uh, considered a magnet school and they only went up to third grade. When I was in kindergarten, they went up to fifth grade. And I remember seeing some of my older cousins and relatives graduate the fifth grade. It was a, you know, a moving up ceremony. And um, we all wanted to do that, but then by the time I got to third grade, they said, that's it, more school only goes up to third grade. And then many of us had to go to different schools depending on where we lived. We lived in the Charles Street Housing Project downtown Poughkeepsie, uh, off of Mill Street, I think it is. And um, we end up going to Columbus Elementary School on Perry Street, and that's where we graduated from the fifth grade. And uh, so I drove to, the, to those elementary schools and took photos. And then I made my way to um, Poughkeepsie Middle School where we graduated uh, eighth grade and then Poughkeepsie High School. And it was really emotional for me to drive to those schools, which are at the very foundation of who and what I am today. They say, never forget where you came from. And then I drove to Charles Street and walked around, you know, uh, and uh, Pulaski Pool, mm -hmm. Malcolm X Park, Wheaton Park. A lot of childhood memories in these in these uh, spaces and places. Mansion Street um, Park, uh, the, one of the great green spaces in the city of Newburgh, um, and then Vassar College. And you know we love Vassar. We we my mother used to take us to Vassar College and New Paltz in the summer to inspire us to read more and to uh, look to um, get a higher education. My mom and my dad had eighth or ninth grade educations uh, did finish high school and so I'm the youngest of eight and I'll end you with this I'm the youngest of eight first graduate high school and college and graduate school and of course my siblings would finish after that including my twin brother and uh, you know Poughkeepsie is is special to me and will always be special to me my mom is 88 now you know and uh she, when I go to visit her, mostly on the weekends, my wife lets me go visit <laughs> on the weekends. And um, she tells me every time when I walk in the house and even when I leave, when I leave, she'll say, you leaving already? And I'm, I'm mom, I've been here three or four hours. <laughs> and she's like, well, I don't want you to leave yet. <laughs> you know. And then she'll always tell me, you know, you, you and your brothers and sisters, you, you've made me specially proud. So... That's what this represents for me. Thank you guys for coming out. Thank you.